Welcome to the More Than Fitness Podcast. And welcome, responsible delinquents, to another episode of the More Than Fitness Podcast. I hope you guys have been foaming at the mouth to hear my angelic voice once again, um, because I am uh, I'm happy to be here. I'm happy to come on the pod again. I know it's been a little bit spotty. Uh, I apologize for that. I appreciate those of you who are still sticking around to listen um, because I promise I am going to continue putting out episodes in the future with guests, with myself. Uh, but I just wanted to make sure that I came on here whenever I actually had something worth talking about, right? Uh, I didn't want to just come on here for the sake of coming on here because I realized that that was creating a little bit of burnout for me. So I wanted to come on here when I was like, okay, I've got some shit that I think would be really helpful to my responsible delinquents with your old goals, uh, something different for you guys to think about and and take value from and hopefully implement into your life to make it better. Uh, Right. So so there's a couple of things that I want to talk about today. um, But the very first one is going to be I'm going to break down your entire fitness plan, right? So most of the people listening to this, you're probably going to have some type of like fat loss goals. That's usually the the main goal that a lot of the people who follow me uh, have. And so what I wanted to do is simply break down fat loss and muscle gain in the simplest terms possible, right? Uh, and how do I, the reason the the inspiration from this came from a certain podcast I was listening to about business, and they just broke things down in a very simple manner that kind of cut through all the noise and all the fluff and and all of these different tactics or, or things that you uh, think matter, but they don't actually matter. And it's it's kind of like a first principles thinking. And so I kind of want to jump to the first principles of fat loss and muscle gain for you guys. Right, and, and this starts with a, a a a quote or a lesson that I put up actually on my Instagram story the other day, and it it, it went like this, and it was all of your fitness goals, and if you want to stay healthy forever, all it comes down to is choosing the long term over the short term, right? Like that's all that's all it is. Um, because long-term thinking gives you long-term results, right? And, and that's that's literally the root of a lot of this fitness stuff. And you can replace fitness with self-help, personal development, you know, personal finance, whatever it is, right? The 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 way to reach your fitness goals and the way to be healthy forever is to constantly figure out how can I choose the long term over the short term. Right. And of course, it's not always just that simple, but for the most part, like that's what we're trying to do. Right. And and I think that if you can constantly look at your choices through that filter, it's going to make the choices a lot easier. Right. So that's kind of the macro perspective on reaching your goals and staying healthy. And it comes down to choosing the long term choice and delaying that short term gratification um, to do what is best for you. All right. Now, next, whenever it comes to fat loss, I'm going to try and break this down as simple as I possibly can. And obviously, there's going to be lots of nuance in here. But I, I, for me, I know that whenever I understand the first principles of a concept or if I understand kind of the root of how it works, uh, it makes all the other underlying decisions underneath that much easier easier, right? So it kind of gives me the main direction, the North star, like, okay, if I constantly remember this, my other actions, um, can align with that. And then the, the choosing this thing, choosing white rice over brown rice, for example, is minutia. That's dumb to worry about. Right. But with fat loss, most of you guys know already that a calorie deficit is going to be what allows for fat loss. Right. And so what that means is that right every single day you have a calorie amount that you expend. Right. And so you expend that through exercise, through just existing. Right. Also, whenever you eat food to digest that food, you have to burn calories. You have to use energy to burn 
uh, or I'm sorry, to digest that food. And so all of these things are calories out, right? So it, it with fat loss, it does come down to, for the most part, calories in, calories out. You eat fewer calories than you burn and you're going to lose fat, right? And so now basically all of our decisions that we make in a day have to align with that. Right? And so, so everything that we're trying to do, we're trying to create a calorie deficit to elicit that fat loss, but how we create that calorie deficit, that's where things obviously get uh, a little bit tricky. Uh, however, that's the main thing. So it's, it's basically like, how can I achieve this calorie deficit? And then how can I uh, create a food plan, right? Or choose certain foods to make hitting that calorie deficit easier. And that usually involves choosing foods that are going to allow you to, to stay full, right? So it's going to be easier uh, on your satiation. It's going to uh, be foods that keep you fuller for longer. Because if you're eating fewer calories than you're burning, your body is naturally going to increase your hunger a little bit, right? Because that's just a natural survival mechanism survival mechanism that makes sense, right? If you're, if you're eating fewer calories than you're burning, your body's going to be like, okay, at least over time, the, the adaptation, the adaptation that makes the most sense is, Hey dude, or dudette, <laughs> we're hungry. We need food. So I'm going to ramp up your hunger and then that's going to make you eat more food. But the best way to combat this is to choose foods that are very filling. So that would be foods like higher in protein, higher in fiber, um, and just highly nutrient dense foods. And that's the opposite of foods that are energy dense. For example, they're hyper palatable foods. And so energy dense means that they have a lot of energy, right? So they have a lot of calories in a unit of food. So donuts, for example, right? Donuts are very energy dense. And if you have a budget of 2000 calories in a day, and you have 300 calories that you can spend on this one meal, it doesn't make sense to use all 300 calories on an energy dense donut, for example. Why? Because it's going to be a poor use of your calorie budget for that day because you're going to eat that donut and sure, it's going to be delicious. However, you're going to be hungry very quickly after that. And so instead, it makes more sense like, okay, instead of 300 calories from the donut, what if we got 300 calories from a grilled chicken salad, for example, right? You have grilled chicken in there. Maybe you have some olive oil on the grilled chicken. Of course, you have tons of different vegetables, um, but you're, you're going to have a larger amount of food that you can eat to get that same 300 calories, right? So that's, that's kind of the, the, the basis here. And so fat loss is taken care of with calories in and calories out. So we want to be in a calorie deficit. And how you get there, how you know, because you might be like, okay, how do I know if I'm in a calorie deficit, right? I will include a link to one of my blog posts that will show you six steps on how to create a calorie deficit. But one of the easiest ways, and I explained this in the article, but to sum that ar article up somewhat quickly, however, I do recommend you read that. It's just, you track your food. So you know how much you're eating on a daily basis, and then you track your weight. And let's say you do that for about two weeks and you, let's say you eat 1800 calories every single day, right? For two weeks, you maintain 18, around 1800 calories every single day. And then you notice that your scale weight is staying the same, right? For this example, we'll, st we'll say that the, the, you're eating 1800 calories a day every day for two weeks. And you're also weighing yourself every single morning, right? And throughout those two weeks, your weight stays just about the same. It's not going to be the same exact number every single day. However, the average of those two weeks are about the same. Okay. If that's the case, what is that telling us? That's telling us that the food that we are eating, and then also because exercise is also going to be another factor in this equation, right? But let's say we keep exercise as a constant variable throughout this. So you work out three days per week, both weeks, right? For example, and still your weight is maintained. So this means that your calorie maintenance is about 1800 calories and you're working out three days per week, right? 
that's, that's your calorie maintenance. So we know that if we want to lose fat, then we need to be in a calorie deficit. So you need to eat below 1800 calories, right? And so in this example, I would say to drop your calories down to about 1500 to 1600 for the next two weeks and see what happens. My guess is that based off of what just happened the previous two weeks where you maintained your weight at 1800 calories and working out three days per week, if you drop that down to about 1600 calories per day and you're still working out three days per week, I would say you'll probably end up losing some fat as a result. You'll probably start to see the scale go down a little bit, right? So that just means that you're in a calorie deficit. Yay, you did it, right? Like that's that's literally as simple as it gets with the fat loss stuff. Of course, I know there's more nuance. Of course, that you have to take into consideration your schedule, other variables and things like that. However, I hope that gives you an idea of the, the main macro goal that we are trying to accomplish on a regular basis to facilitate that fat loss. And now it's like, okay, if you know that your calorie deficit number is around 1600, let's give you a range. So let's say 1500 to 1700 calories per day. And now what meals can we make up throughout your day to equal 1500 to 1700 calories per day? right? And so if you have three meals per day, for example, and you're trying to eat 1500 calories, then each meal should be about 500 calories. Or if you know that dinner time is usually where you eat more in a meal, well, then maybe it makes sense to have 400 calories at breakfast, 400 calories at lunch, and then 700 calories at dinner. And that still equates to 1500 calories per day, right? That's as simple as it gets with, with fat loss. Of course, again, I know that there's other variables involved in this, but whenever it comes to thermodynamics and whenever it comes to creating calorie deficit and whenever it can't, comes to the main big rocks that are going to allow you to lose fat on a regular basis, that's it, right? That is it. How can I create a calorie deficit on a regular basis without hating my life? <laughs> you know, that's going to be the biggest thing. Okay. And then... To add on to that, to make sure that we either gain or maintain muscle mass in this process, well, then what do we do, right? Because calories are one part of the equation. However, if you're, eat, if you're in a calorie deficit and you're not paying attention to these two things that are the most important for your muscle gain, then you're maybe losing weight, but it's both from fat and from muscle, right? And that's not what we want. What we want is fat loss, not necessarily just weight loss. And so to prevent losing muscle, we make sure that we're eating enough protein on a regular basis. And then we also make sure that we're lifting weights, right? Those two things are going to be the big rocks that are going to allow us to maintain or gain muscle mass while in a calorie deficit. And so with the protein intake, for most of you, I would say to start at about 0.7 grams per pound of your body weight. And so just do the math there and then try and hit that number. And if you can hit that number consistently, then you're, you're mostly good to go. I would try to consistently try to get closer to one gram per pound of body weight. But if you're really overweight and you have a lot of fat to lose, that might you might be looking at that number. It's like if you're 260 pounds, right? And right now you're maybe eating 80 grams of protein. Well, then it doesn't make sense to try and bump your protein up to 260 grams of protein every single day. That's going to be quite a bit. So that's why I say start with like 0.6 or 0.7 grams per pound uh, of protein. Yes, of protein and start there and then work your way up. Or if you don't want to have to do the math and all the things, like just make sure that you're having a decent amount of protein at every single meal and you're going to be much better off, right? So I'm going to try and not get too nuanced here, but that's, that's the main things, right? So protein intake and then working out. So resistance training, you have to give your muscles a reason to stick around, right? Because the thing with her muscles is that our bodies don't want to be very lean. They don't want to be low in body fat, and they also don't want to be very muscular, why? Because excess body fat means that we are safe and that we're going to have plenty of energy to go around so that we can stay safe and that we can do human things, right? 
So our bodies don't want to be leaner. Also, um, muscle is very energy expensive, right? So muscle, it takes a lot of calories and it takes a lot of energy to maintain that muscle mass. Because you got to think, it's like, there's no reason to have big biceps from a evolutionary standpoint, right? It's like, there's no reason to, you know, have a big chest or have big shoulders or have big glutes or anything like that. It's like, there's not many evolutionary advantages to that, right? Of course, strength could be an example. However, it's like, that's not necessarily meaning, hey, you need big biceps. Being strong doesn't necessarily mean that you have to like sculpt your hamstrings or your calves or anything like that, you know? Um, So what I'm saying is that biologically, our bodies are working against us with these things. And so to counterbalance that, we have to make sure that we have our calories in check and we want to be in a moderate calorie deficit. We don't want to be in a super big calorie deficit because if we try and lose too quickly, then our body, those adaptations that I was talking about, whenever your body is like, oh, I'm going to be, I need to be hungry because we're not eating very much food. So I'm trying to encourage you to eat more food, right? Well, if you slash your calories very quickly and you do a pretty aggressive uh, calorie deficit right from the jump, well, then some of those adaptations will ramp up, right? So your your hunger, for example, is going to ramp up very quickly the, the more you slash that deficit. And then also your muscles are going to be more at risk the more of the calorie deficit that you um create as well. So the larger the deficit, the more at risk you are for losing muscle mass. And this is where it can get very complicated in things, but hopefully you, you've stuck with me this far, right? Uh, and so to make sure that we're, we're building our muscles and we're keeping our muscles while in a calorie deficit, you want to make sure that your calories are in check. So at a moderate calorie deficit, and then also to maintain our muscle mass or to grow our muscle mass, we need to keep our protein high enough to actually allow for the building and repair of those muscles, right? And then also we need to consistently lift weights. We need to resistance train so that we kind of um, train our bodies. Hey, we need this muscle or we're trying to hold on to this muscle mass. And so that's why you break it down in the gym and then you repair it with protein and calories, right? And so that's that's mostly it. But with, with the gym, right? Because it's not just like, oh, do anything in the gym. Although research has shown that it takes very little actually to any time. So after you've built muscle mass, it doesn't take a whole lot of lifting to actually maintain the amount of muscle mass that you currently have, right? Which is a good sign, which is great. Um, however, if we want to build that muscle mass, all it comes down to is progressive overload right? That's the other term. So like what calorie deficit is to fat loss, progressive overload is to working out and building muscle, right? Because all we're trying to do is make our body adapt. And that's how you build muscle. And the way that you do that is by progressively overloading the muscle with more work than it can currently sustain, right? You have to make it grow. Why do you think it grows? It's because we are kind of forcing it to. We're trying to force it to adapt to the stimulus, right? So to the progressive overload, to the lifting weights that we're doing, right? And it's trying to adapt to that. And progressive overload, all it means is simply doing more work over time. It's, it's literally what it means, like progressive overload. You're just overloading progressively over time. And you can do that. Most people think that you can only do that through lifting more load, right? So by increasing the weight on the bar, for example, or using heavier dumbbells, right? And that's only one method of progressive overload. There's actually a lot of methods of progressive overload, but doing more work is an umbrella term for, uh, it could be increasing load. So increasing the weight on the bar. It could also be increasing reps, right? So if you did three sets of eight last week on bench press with 135 pr- with 135 pounds, well, on week two, you could try to aim for three sets of nine with 135 pounds, and that would be a form of progressive overload. Even if you did two sets of eight with 135 pounds, 
and then you did one set of nine with 135 pounds, that would still be progressive overload, right? That would still be doing more work than you did the week prior. And this isn't exactly linear because you can't just constantly add more and more stimulus over time. But for the most part, again, I'm trying to keep this as simple as possible, rooted in first principles, just to give you guys an idea of the main direction that you need to go with this type of stuff. And that is it, right? And so you can you can increase the load. So you can increase the weight on the bar. You can increase the amount of reps that you do. You can also, of course, increase the amount of sets that you do. So instead of doing three, so you did three sets of eight in week one, you do four sets of eight in week two, right? That's just another example. Uh, another example of progressive overload would be doing the same sets, reps, and weight, except maybe your technique was better on the second week than it was on week one. So if you controlled those reps better, if you controlled each one of those sets better than week one, well, that's going to be improving your technique. And that's also going to be a form of progressive overload. If you, and then this, uh, this is the last one I'll say, um, <clears throat> let's say on week one, you did three sets of eight with 135 pounds, and then you rested 90 seconds between each set right? Three sets of eight with 135 pounds and you rested 90 seconds between each set. The next week, let's say you did three sets of eight with 135 pounds, but you rested 80 seconds between each set. That would be a form of progressive overload because your recovery was enhanced from the week prior. So you're doing more work in less time, or I'm sorry, you're doing the same amount of work in less time. So that would be a form of progressive overload. And so you see all of these things, right? This is this is what we're trying to accomplish with our workouts. And so that's why so many people can get caught up in like, oh, should I do this exercise? Should I do this exercise? Should I have this angle or this angle? Of course, it is more complicated than, than what I just made it. However, it's like the, the root of all of it is what I just said. For, for gaining muscle, it's gonna be making sure that your protein is high enough and then it's also going to be making sure that you're progressively overloading over time. So you're giving your muscles a reason to stick around or to grow. And with losing fat, you need to eat fewer calories or burn more calories than, uh, or I'm sorry, you need to eat fewer calories than you're burning, right? So you need to be in a calorie deficit. You need to be below that calorie maintenance level. And you can create that calorie deficit either by eating fewer calories, so eating less food, and or moving more because you can also burn calories through cardio or exercise, right? So instead of taking away 300 calories from your uh, uh, calorie maintenance, right? So if it was 1800 calories, that's your maintenance calories. Instead of eating 1500 calories, for example, instead you could run for an hour and a half every single day and instead create that calorie deficit through burning calories, right? But there's other, obviously it's, it's usually much easier to just not eat 300 calories as opposed to running 90, 90 minutes every single day of the week. Right. But of course you can interchange these a little bit. It's like, maybe you do cardio for two days per week, and then that will help offset things a little bit. Um, and so that's it. That's literally it. I, I, I just wanted to kind of break that down for you guys because where are we at? 23 minutes, right? So this it was just something that has been on my mind and I hope that that was helpful for you guys because, and I hope you kind of stuck around there with me. I tried to explain it as simple, simple as I can, but I just know whenever I heard on the business podcast, I heard them kind of break it down in very simple terms. I was just like, it was kind of my eureka, like aha moment. And I was like, oh, this is first principles thinking. This is okay. What is the root of the problem or what is the main objective that we're trying to accomplish? And how can we now create a plan that keeps those major things, those major principles at top of mind? And how can we make those to, how can we accomplish those as easy as possible, for example, right? Um, and so this is also why I created my frictionless fat loss course. 
you know, so my, my frictionless fat loss course is how can I do the least amount of work to lose the most fat possible? That's, that's why I kind of created it is I wanted to keep these principles in mind. I was like, okay, how can I create a course around this? So it's a, it's a seven day email course. You can join for free with the link is in the description. Um, many of you guys have already done it. I've gotten great feedback from those who have already gone through it. So thank you so much for doing that. Um, but if you want to kind of everything that I just said, if you want to kind of put that into practice, uh, and you want to also, uh, kind of work with your human psychology, uh, and behavior change, I would highly recommend you download the course. It's completely free and you'll get the course over a seven day period. Um, and I'll teach you a lot of the stuff that I just mentioned, except I'll explain it in a way that you can apply to your own lifestyle based off of your own routine, right? It's so it's, it's kind of like when I, the reason why it's called frictionless fat loss is because I want to figure out how can we work with ourselves, not against ourselves with this fat loss stuff. And so that's why I wanted to remove as much friction as possible from what you're doing now and the goals that you're trying to achieve with, uh, um, your weight loss journey. Right. So that's, that's what I would recommend. I would highly recommend to download frictionless fat loss, give it a go. And I think you'll, you'll get a lot out of it by the end of the seven days. <clears throat> okay. Um, and yeah, I think actually that is all I wanted to really touch on today. I think I'm going to cut it off there because that was kind of all encompassing of uh, uh, what I had on my mind. And it was, uh, I hope that that kind of really helps you guys out. I hope you can kind of keep that in the top of your mind whenever you go throughout this week, um, remembering that. And if you need to go back and re-listen through, or if you want to send me a message and you want to ask me questions, please, uh, I, I'm very I'm very open to that. Um, oh, also... I am going to include a question uh, form in the description. So if you have a question that you want to ask on the podcast uh, and you want me to answer it, I will happily do that. Just fill out the link. Take two seconds. You have a, a specific question for me. Give me as much details as possible about your current situation. And I'd be happy to answer it here on the podcast for you. Um, yeah, there was a couple other things that I was going to touch on today, but I think I'm going to cut it here uh, because I'm sure that that was uh, uh, quite a bit for you guys to kind of digest. And now you can go, you can join the course. You can also check out the uh, blog post, the article that I mentioned about creating a calorie deficit. Um, I think that that would help a lot of you guys out, especially in kickstarting this journey for you guys. Um, and yeah, I think that's it. And also, uh, I have a couple spots remaining in January, although I know January is almost up um, for one to one coaching. So if you want to outsource this stuff, if you want my help um, in, in figuring out, OK, let's let's figure out a game plan for you over at least the next 90 days because summer is coming up. It is approaching very quickly. Uh, I have a couple spots for one to one coaching. So if you are into that, uh, you can fill out the application. It is linked in the description as well. Um, and yeah, I'm excited to to get this episode out there for you guys. Uh, I will again be be trying to I'll be trying to do these every single week, uh, for sure. Every single two weeks, I'm going to try and book some more guests, get on some really good guests for you guys. Keep having some good conversations because I really enjoy those. Um, but yeah, other than that, check the description for the next steps, um, and I will catch you next time. As always, guys, thank you so much for listening and for watching. See you.